Um, and so this is, this is usually when, when authors are talking about quarks. They're talking about stuff like this. Um, ways to humanize your characters through small detail. All right? You can write that down. Ways to humanize your characters through small detail. Usually, when you write, write this word and you start talking to people, and you, if I were to ask for a list of quirks, you would go bonkers. You would say the most weird things that you could come up with, because that's kind of what the word quirk means to us. They don't have to be that weird. Um, now, weird can be very good. Depends on the type of story you're telling. And Tangled gets into that. Tangled is playing off of the contrast between big burly man and guy who wants to be a ballet dancer or whatever it is that, you know, each of these, each of these guys has a, a really weird quirk for who you picture them being. Um, and that works for contrast, but it doesn't have to be humorous like that. Um, you, you have, you know, characters who just do interesting things. What is it? Is it, is it Saving Private Ryan where the guy takes, um, takes dirt from every place he's been? Um, that's cool. A simple thing to do, and suddenly you understand this person. That's a quirk. And it's not in direct contrast. It's just an expansion of who they are. Um, you can collect and gather these from people you meet and start stealing them like thieves. That's what you do. You're a writer. Um, <laughs> and be watching just and be thinking about this. You can have quirks, you know, hobbies, interests, Actions, um, tells. Having a tell for a character, particularly a side character, can be pretty useful. Uh, don't go overboard on this, but this is some sort of visual cue that sticks in the, the reader's mind as they encounter that character. Much more important for side characters that are not going to be having viewpoints than main characters. But if you will watch a lot of films or read a lot of books that quickly characterize, you will see that, someone ha that people have tells. Tells are things like, um, you know, this person is always tapping their foot. Um, or this person is the one with the eye patch. That's an easy tell to remember. Um, and giving them a tell that relates somehow to their hobbies or their quirks can be a very useful way to quickly characterize a side character and give them a little bit more rounding. Okay? This is one method. Um, another method is the dossier method. This is a method that a lot of writers use. I don't actually use this one, but one of my goals in this class is to give you multiple methods to try making your characters more rounded. One of them is to start thinking about their quirks. One is the dossier. The dossier is a, um, a list of questions you ask yourself about every character to force yourself basically to do this, but to also to come up with a backstory to, to fill out their passions and their interests and all of these sorts of things. It'll ask you things like, what's their favorite food? Um, you know, who do they hate most in life? Is this kind of like a literary um, representation of like method acting? Mm. That even if even if it's happening off stage, they they kind of create this persona for themselves. Yeah, sure. Write it into the book. I mean, w what I would call the method acting part is what we're going to get into later, which is viewpoint, uh, which is how you use your viewpoint. But this is just good storytelling. I don't know if it counts as method acting or what. It's just ways to know your characters. Um, there, there's the old adage in writing that you generally want to look at storytelling like an iceberg, meaning what you show the reader is this much, but you, you ha have this much understanding about what's going on, um, and kind of give them hints about this much. Um, there, there is that theory of writing. Um, I do think this leads you dangerously toward uh, world builder's disease. Um, if you feel like you need to have this much before you can tell this much, um, really all you actually need to do is this much. Meaning you have to show this much and be able to hint that there's all of this stuff down here. And if you can hint at it, then you don't actually have to do it. Because they'll make it up for you. Um, and that's part of the point of doing things like this. Um, my friend Dan, uh, excellent writer, always says skimp on the large details and uh, be very uh, forthcoming with the small details. Meaning when he wants to describe a room, instead of you walk into the room and him giving this big, long description of the room, he picks one small detail and focuses on it. Um, you know, the, the shack had bullet holes in the window. And gives you one very interesting detail about it or about the person 
so that you, you get this and then you begin imagining the entire world down here of all of these things. Dan is a discovery writer. I guarantee Dan doesn't have it, much of this. Um, what Dan is really good at doing is making you think he has all of this and that's the point. We are, um, in a lot of ways, what we're doing as writers is we are stage magicians. All right, These worlds you're creating do not exist. At the, their fundamental core, you are telling a great big lie. Okay, And your job is, while people are reading those pages, to convince them and make them pretend along with you that the lie is truth. Okay, And the methods you use to do that are up to you. But like a good stage magician, usually you're wagging something in front of their faces while you're doing something over here that's going to later on smack them in the face. Um, and that's one of your jobs. That's what we call good foreshadowing, um, is when you're waggling something over here and then you smack them on the side of the head. Um, these are all methods of doing that. All right? And this is, this is a shared lie. Everyone who picks up a book knows this isn't real. But they want to participate in this. They want to join in and they are your willing participant if you can do your job well, which is not kick them out of the story, which is not, you know, um, do all, all these things we're going to talk about that kind of ruin the experience. And they'll be disappointed or put the book down if you're not tricking them enough. Right. That depends on genre. Um, but yeah. So anyway, quirks. So dossier method. You can find dossiers online, character dossiers, qu lists of questions to ask yourself about your characters. Bloggers love to post these. Um, writing bloggers will be like, 25 questions to ask yourself about every character. And you'll find posts and posts and posts about things like this. Um, I don't use it because I like to, I discovery write my characters. Um, as I told you before, I tend to uh, architect my worlds and my plots and then cast a character in the role and explore who they are through writing through their eyes. And that usually means I start chapter one three or four times until I find the right character and then I go with it. Yeah. Do you plan? Just talk about growth. Do you plan where they grow to? Um, after I know who they are, I will. And I will often be revising my outline as I go along. Because um, you run into this thing. People will talk about characters who, um, who have a life of their own, who just do things you aren't expecting. That doesn't happen to me. I'm an architect. Even though I discover about my characters, I'm always in control of my story. Things don't surprise me. What happens is, as I write along and I, um, I start to really um, figure out this character, I realize, OK, this character is not going to do this thing that the plot calls for, for the, the character in that role to do. And so therefore, I have to go back to my outline and I have to rebuild my outline using the characters I know who they are now um, to, to work it out. This is why often I actually won't finish my outline until I've got those first few chapters done. I'll do like 75%, then I'll go write the first few chapters, then I'll go back and rebuild my outline now that I know who everybody is. But still, through the course of the book, I will, they will grow. And I will, dis uh, I will discovery write them, meaning I will let them kind of come to fulfill their role or things like this as I go along. All right? Yeah. As a follow up to that, how, do you, how can you tell if they're, like, what's a good way to tell if they're growing? Like, I don't know. Like, how okay, we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the, it's tough for me to talk about character because I do them so organically. But I can definitely talk about how we know if they're growing or not. All right? So. Um, all right, so dossier method. I'm not going to write that up there because I don't know how to spell dossier. Um, nah, you don't need to tell me. <laughs> I've already moved on. We're beyond that. We're gone. It's, it's French, so it's mm -hmm. I know French. Yeah. Um, next method, this is one that Dave suggested when he taught this class um, many years ago, was to intentionally cast the wrong person in the role in the story that you have built for them. Meaning, if you're working on your plot and you kind of know what type of story you want to do, so you want to tell a heist story or you know, you're going to tell a romance, your first question to yourself is, why can't this person be in this role? What prevents them? What are the big problems? Why would they be much better in the other roles? In other words, you jumble around the roles. You, you, know, you, you, you stick the wise mentor, the person you were planning in that, and instead you make them the romantic interest. And you, know, you take the romantic interest, and instead you make them the plucky sidekick, or whatever it is. You've, you know, you've filled out the role. You've analyzed the plot that you're trying to tell, and you jumble up the roles. Um, the purpose being to force yourself to put square pegs into round holes and pound them in there. Um, this is a source of way of creating conflict. 
uh, if your character doesn't feel like they belong in the role they're in, that's generally going to be a good thing. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, we, we all are probably tired of um, whiny heroes who don't believe that they're actually a hero, but they also can be the most, some of the most endearing characters, you know, like the person who doesn't believe they're a hero but is acting heroically. It works really well. Uh, you could probably name off half a dozen stories where you have the reluctant hero who doesn't actually think they're a hero but they're doing heroic things and they've become, you know, some of the most um, interesting characters in the books because they're in a role they don't think that they fit. Or a person that's a sidekick to the hero, but then it's like, I want to be the hero now, and kind of like, so it's a conflict that way. Yeah, that could be a conflict, whatever, but you just stick them in, again, stick the square peg in the round hole. Find a way, this is, this is another method. You don't have to use any of these, you can, use, you can mix them, but it is a way to force yourself to round out your characters. Uh, the problem here is going to be, generally for new writers, you're going to start writing and your protagonist is going to be one of two things. Either they're going to be exactly like you and so they're going to kind of be bland or they're going to be exactly like, they're going to be kind of bland because you're not doing the work on them. You're going to cut the corners. You're going to be like, yeah, this is, I know this character. They just are, I mean, this happens a lot and sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, but if you focus on any sort of uh, groupings of, of characters, usually the main character has trouble in that they tend to be the most bland. Um, they do feel real, but they tend to be the most bland. You can look at Harry Potter and Ron and Hermione, who's the most bland? Harry, Harry character-wise, is the most bland. Now, there's an argument in YA that people make, which is a pretty legit one, which is that um, the blank slate main character, um, the main character being a blank slate surrounded by interesting people so that you can put yourselves in the, the shoes of the main character and therefore experience it as if you were in there. It's not Harry whose best friend is Ron, it's you whose best friend is Ron. Um, however, that's one argument. You can decide whether to do it. Um, you can decide to go that way if you want to or not, but it is an issue um, for some writers that they kind of just assume that the main character is going to either be most like them or they're just the hero, so I don't need to focus on them as much. It's kind of a contrast to what I said earlier. Um, this is just problems that people fall into. Uh, for me, my main characters tended to be very interesting. My side characters tended to be very flat, um, quirky, but flat, meaning they didn't have passion in life. They were just there to fulfill a role. Um, that's what I noticed about myself. All right.